First off to our visitors, uh, we're not always like this. Sometimes we're worse. <laughs> but uh, we're so thrilled you're here. Listen, you know, there's a line in that song that I think today is more germane to what's going on in our world when it says uh, about the baby that, and I don't even know the whole sentence, but the baby can face uncertain days because we know he lives. Amen? Amen. And boy, parents, if there's ever a time to teach your children who, what Jesus is and has done, they are going to face an ever-darkening world. And the only hope is Christ. Amen. And I'm going to be honest with you. If I wasn't in a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, when I read the news, and I read it every day, I, am, I could be depressed, sullen. And when I shut that news off, and, and I just... The only way I get my spiritual equilibrium back is to be reminded because he lives. Amen. Amen. That in the end, Christ will reign supreme. Amen. And on your worst days of listening to what is being said and done in our country, and you're wondering if God is asleep in heaven, just read Psalm 2. Don't do it now. Don't be turning to Psalm 2 now. But just know this, God sits on any, God the Father sits on an eternal throne. He's not asleep. He is going to accomplish that which he has set forth that he's going to do. And everything you see that's going on right now in our world, all the darkness, God is just moving his eternal drama to its ultimate conclusion when Jesus is going to call his bride home and he's going to reign supreme. And whatever it is that our Heavenly Father allows us to go through, remember two things in your life. I don't care if it's physical pain, emotional pain, uh, what you see going on in the world. There's two things that settles me every morning. You ready? God is sovereign. God is sovereign. You understand that? God is sovereign. That means there's nothing that can happen unless God allows it. Now, that's good, but it's the second truth that makes that first truth even better, and it's this. God loves me. So if he's sovereign, and he loves me enough to send his son to die on a cross for my sins and be raised on the third day, it's going to be okay. Because as Paul said in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So it's okay. It's going to be okay. So if you're here today and you're struggling with something, anything, if you're a child of God, I pray that when you leave here, the Holy Spirit will remind you of these two truths. God is sovereign and he loves you. And if you say, well, if God's sovereign, why am I in this mess? Man, I, that's above my pay grade. It is. But I can tell you this, if you're a child of God, Romans 8, 28 is still true, amen? amen? To those who love God, we know that God, right? He's going to work it all out. He's going to work it all out. And so rather than just looking for exits all the time, ask God what it is he wants you to learn through this. Better to go through it and develop a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ than continually looking for an exit just so you don't have to deal with anything. So just remember, that's all free. It's not even my sermon today. If you have your Bibles, I preach out of this text every Resurrection Day. Uh, for me, I know for some, it's Easter Sunday. For me, it's always going to be called Resurrection Sunday because that's what we're here to do is to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so before we get started, I just want to lift up a prayer to my father that his spirit has his way this day in our service. So let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before your throne now. Lord, I want everyone to understand that we worship in song. We worship in the reading, study, and implementation of your word. We worship in our giving. Father, all of these acts should be acts of worship. 
We ought to do them joyfully. And so, God, I'm going to ask this morning that you, uh, by your supernatural power, just suppress all the, the worries and burdens and anxieties and cares that we all have today. Just, Lord, with your help, can we just push them aside and spend the next 35, 40 minutes listening attentively to your word? So that we can go out of here with our spiritual batteries recharged. And that we can make a difference in our community. I love you so much. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Matthew 28, 1 through 10 reads this way. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. There are so many nuggets in this. Amen. That angel didn't roll it away so Jesus could get out. He rolled it away so we could get in. Amen. Oh, come on. You ain't awake. And his appearance, the angel's appearance, was like lightning. And his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men, prostrate on the ground. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Now, I'm not, I don't have time to preach this really too much. This, but he never said to those guards, don't be afraid. It's an important distinction. If you're here today and Jesus is not Lord of your life, you have every right to fear death. But if you're a Christian... Take the angel's declaration to heart. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. For he has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take, the, take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. What's the big deal of the resurrection? Why is it so important? John MacArthur says of the resurrection, this quote, number one, Lee, he said this, the central event of that climax, of that whole weekend of the passion, the, the death and resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is also the central event of God's redemptive history. Can I just say that again? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is also the central event of God's redemptive history. The resurrection is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. And everything that we are and have and hope to be is predicated on its reality. Listen to me. Listen to what he says, this next line. There would be no Christianity if there were no resurrection. The message of Scripture has always been a message of resurrection hope. A message that death is not the end for those who belong to God. And all God's people said... I want to tell you, it's my goal, it's my dream, it's my passion that every Christian in this room would be able to articulate. If you were sitting with a, uh, a unsaved, lost uh, person and they asked you a question, why do you guys make such a big deal of Easter weekend? What would you say to them? More importantly, what scriptures could you take them to to show them why it's a big deal? Because listen, far more powerful than your paraphrase is thus saith the Lord. In Isaiah, God makes clear his word will not return unto him void. It's going to accomplish that which he wants it to do. 
In Romans 10, Paul said, for faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the words of Christ. And so friends, we have to get familiar with the word of God. We have to be able to open the scriptures with people that don't know him. The scriptures, according to Paul in Ephesians 6, 6 are the, is, is the a word, the, the sword of the spirit. It's not even your sword, it's his sword. But what we need to do is pick it up and, and use it according to his direction. So I'm going to give you four truths today that are four of the real significant realities that are true because Jesus got out of that empty tomb. Four. I'll give you four. There's five or seven. In fact, there's probably 10 of them. I'm going to give you four central ones. And when I'm done, you're going to understand why that song, Because He Lives, is my favorite song. It's because of these truths that we're about to look at in the Bible. Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Man, if He wasn't alive, Sally, with all the hell that's going around, we'd be in a mess. Now, the nation is in a mess, but I'm not. You understand? I'm not in a mess. Our nation is, but I'm not. I'm a follower of the risen Christ. And I pray that you are too. Four things. Number one, let me just give you the four points real quick. The resurrection validates Christ as the Son of God. You realize Jesus is the only one that ever got out of the grave. You know, not Muhammad, not bon, uh, Buddha, not Gandhi, or any of those other uh, uh, so-called gods. If you went to where they were laid in the, whatever tomb they got laid in, their bones would still be there. Amen? The reason why Jesus is declared with power the Son of God is because he got up out of the grave. Secondly, the resurrection completes the gospel that saves us. Friends, it takes both the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ to complete the gospel message. The resurrection conquers the grave for us. Amen? It conquers the grave for us, and it's what gives us our living hope. And finally, the resurrection assures us of a reunion day with our uh, dead saint family. Like, I won't have a resurrection with my dad. He, he died lost. I won't see him again, but I'll see my mama. There's going to be a reunion day, amen? So, let's get started. What's the big deal about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Number one, it validates him. It validates him. What do I mean? Look at Matthew 28, 5 and 6. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here for he has risen, look at the next four words, just as he said. Jesus had predicted that he would die and raise from the grave. Matthew 16, 21, for the first time in his ministry with his disciples, Jesus began to share with them uh, what was up ahead for him, trying to prepare them. Uh, we read that. It says, from that time, from that time, from that moment, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Now, we could go on where Peter rebukes him and all that, but, but the main point this morning is Jesus had predicted this happening to him, that he was going to suffer, he was going to be killed, and on the third day, praise God, he'd be raised from the grave. It validated Christ. Romans 1, 1 through 4, you need to get familiar with this passage of Scripture. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son. Who, who is his son? Jesus. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. Now get this. Who was declared the son of God with power. How was Jesus declared the son of God with power? By the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So what validated Jesus is that he had said it, he had predicted it, prophesied any way you want to say it. And then on the third day... 
He raised from the dead. There are other places in the New Testament where Jesus began to tell him that he was going to suffer and die. But right here in Matthew, from that time, Jesus began to show. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. But you know what? We have an advantage over those who actually walked with Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives in me. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he was given to me that I might know freely the deep things of God. If you are a believer this morning, it is not... Uh, you don't need an easier translation. Uh, you just need to come hungry and trusting that 1 Corinthians 2, when Paul wrote that under the power of the Holy Spirit, that, 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 that we have the Holy Spirit and he lives in us and he does so. Why? Because he is going to freely, it doesn't cost anything but your time, reveal to us the very deep things of God. I don't know what I know because I'm a pastor. I know what I know because I believe that when I read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And when I come to the Word of God, I just open it and say, God, speak. And I don't worry about what he doesn't give me. I just, whatever he gives me that day. And I know that he's always going to give me that which is best for me to serve him. It validates Jesus. He's the only one of all the so-called God, so-called uh, leaders of mankind that literally was raised from the dead. The second uh, uh, central point of the resurrection, it completes the gospel. Now, if you're an AFM or you know where I'm going to go, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Listen, friends, it takes both the cross and the resurrection. Notice what Paul writes. He says, now I make known to you, brethren. Now, he's talking to Christians here in Corinth. I, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you. Previously, he had preached the gospel to him. What's the gospel? The life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, look, I preached it to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. That's how it works, friends. That's how the Holy Spirit works in all this. Someone preaches it, teaches it, you receive it, not here, but here with the help of the Holy Spirit, and then you take your stand on it. You hear it, you receive it, and you take your stand. And when you do that, verse 2, by which also you are saved. That's how we're saved. Someone told us the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, virgin born, sinless life, sacrificial death, glorious resurrection. That Jesus, the Son of God, is the one that I have placed my faith in that he did die that sacrificial death, and by the power of God he raised from the dead, he is Jesus Christ the Lord. And then he tells us why this gospel. He said, for I delivered to you as of first importance. When you see that first importance, Paul says, it is at the top. There's nothing above it. This is the most important thing any human being and here is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask people all the time, what does a dead, if you're at a funeral and a, there's a dead person, I don't ask it then, but if you were at a funeral and there's a dead person, I always ask them, what does this person need? And, you know, uh, eventually they get around, well, he needs life. Yeah, the only way he'd get out of that casket if he gets life. The only way we're ever going to see glory is if we have spiritual life. Paul said, for I delivered to you as the first important, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Twice, Paul says, my reference for this is the scriptures. My reference is the scriptures. Our reference for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ are the scriptures. Okay? And people will say to you, I don't believe that's nonsense. Don't argue with them. Because until John 6, 44, Jesus said, no man can come to me except the spirit of my father draw them. If they want to be argumentative, it just means God is not drawing them at that time. It'd be like me taking my friend, hey, hey Ricky, if you're listening to this, uh, probably you will be because you put it on your internet radio. When I had the privilege of leading Ricky London, my blind friend to Christ in his home, uh, that would be like when I was, it, it, man, it was hours. I, I was there for hours. That would be like me taking Ricky to the beach in Myrtle Beach, trying to describe a sunrise to him, and then being mad when he didn't get it. Right? I'm fussing at him, I'm screaming at him, and you come walking up and say, dude, what's going on? I said, I'm just mad he won't get it. He won't get it. And so he'd say, you, you know he's blind, right? 
And unless God opens his physical eyes, he, he can't see it. Ricky's been blind from birth. Ricky, I don't know if you even know what colors are. But I know this, that day in his home, God opened the eyes of his heart. And he now sees clearly the gospel. Let's be clear. The gospel that saves invo involves both the, that Christ died for our sins and that he was raised on the third day. Because if we had the time and we don't, in fact, if you want some good reading today after lunch, whatever, just read 1 Corinthians 15. It is the great resurrection chapter where Paul talks about it. In fact, Paul makes it clear in verses 12 through 19, and we won't read them right now, that if Christ, there were some in the Corinthian church that didn't believe Christ was raised from the dead. And so Paul took that hypothesis, okay, you say he's not been raised, then here are the things that aren't true if that's true. Our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. If he's not gotten out of that tomb, Paul said his preaching was vain and our faith is in vain. Paul said also that if that's not true, if he did not raise from the dead, we are false witnesses of God. Faith is worthless and we're yet in our sins. Did you know that? Without the resurrection, you're still in your sins. Those that have died have perished. Paul says, listen, if there is no resurrection from the dead, if Jesus Christ has not gotten out of the tomb, then those that have already died, they've perished. There's nothing for them past the grave. And then he says this. He says, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, we are of all men most to be pitied. How about that? If Jesus hasn't risen, you know why that is? Because we stay away from all the allures of the world. If Jesus didn't get out of the tomb, man, sleep in on Sunday, party hardy on Friday, Saturday. Right? Don't be married. Have 20 girlfriends or boyfriends. Just live it up. If this is all there is, why are we here? Why do we die to ourselves and pick up our cross daily? We do that because he got out of the tomb. And he's our Lord. And he's our Savior. The third thing. The resurrection of Jesus Christ conquers the grave for us. And he gives us our living hope. You know, when the angel declared in Matthew 28, 6, he is not here for he has risen. Just as he said, come see the place where he's lying. Friends, when Jesus rose again, it was an assurance that one day we too would rise from the dead. Did you know that? One day we're going to rise from the dead. It's going to happen. The proof is his resurrection. The same power that got Jesus out of the tomb is the same power that when he comes back for his bride and that shout is given, the graves of Christians are going to burst forth. Man, wow. I've often said if God let me know when that day was, I'd want to plant myself right in a cemetery. I ain't lying. And you know what's true? We'd probably be surprised at some who burst out and some who didn't. Paul knew about the resurrection of the Lord. He wasn't there that day when the empty tomb was discovered. But he had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Started on the Damascus Road. Jesus had appeared to him, had spoke to him, had taught him. And here's the conclusion Paul had about serving Christ. To live for to me, Paul said, he was in prison when he said it. He didn't know if he was going to die. He said, for to me, to live is Christ. The only reason to live is Christ. Right? We just looked at it Friday night. Paul said, now, he has died for all. And so that those who live spiritually should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died and rose again for them. Is Jesus the central figure in your life? Are you driven in your service to Jesus, your kids need you, mom and dad. No youth group can overcome what you're doing in your home. You understand that? If you're living for Jesus and showing them Jesus, that's the best thing that can happen to those kids. You understand that? I preach every week. Most kids in this sanctuary probably daydream the whole sermon until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them. Paul said, for to me, to live is Christ. And you're ready? To die is gain. Well, Paul, what do you mean to gain? Death is to gain. Because Jesus 
rose from the dead. Paul said, but if I am to live on in the flesh, not as sinful flesh, just human flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. There was a part of Paul that wanted to go. He wanted to leave and be with Jesus. There's another part that said, man, my work's not done. There are people that need to be taught. And he, that tension in Paul. That's why he said in verse 23, I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. For Paul, he wasn't confused about the resurrection. He wasn't confused about life after death. He knew that the minute he died, his spirit was going to be with Jesus. That's why in 2 Corinthians 5, he wrote to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And he was hard pressed from both directions. You know, I'm getting that second vaccination shot uh, Wednesday. I got pretty sick after the first one. I'm going to get to the second one Wednesday and, and I'm probably going to get pretty sick. What if, what if it kills you? To live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, I feel sorry for Trudy. Because she's going to miss me. I got to tell you, there are days I wish Jesus would just call me home. I'm not scared of death. I'd like to pick the way I go out. But I'm not scared of the ultimate conclusion. A baby, when you're at my hospital bed or hospice or home... Man, I just want you to read and reread and read Revelation 5 to me. I had the privilege, Ray, of reading that to Bev literally when she took her last breath. It is such a worship chapter of Scripture, of scripture what's going on in heaven, worshiping the crucified Lamb of God, the resurrected Lamb. Paul said, I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ for that is much better. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Listen, these are important verses for you in terms of death and all that, that you can share with your loved ones who maybe are getting ready to cross that river. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, what children? God's children, the ones that he's called. He, Christ himself, likewise also partook of the same that through death, his death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death that is the devil and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives we don't have to be fearful of death we don't have to be enslaved by the thought of death right you know you know i hear people say man i listen listen don't unplug me just keep me plugged in as long as possible man if you're a believer you don't want your family suffering while you're sitting there, vegetable, never going to come back. To, man, unplug me. Let me go. Jesus has conquered death. And I don't have to fear it anymore. So funny, man. We, we talk about how hellish the world is, but we all don't want to leave it. No, seriously. The truth is, if, you, if God would read you your heart and he asked you this question, which do you want, to stay here or to leave and be with Jesus? And if we were going to be really real, we'd want to stay. Man, I don't want to leave my kids, my husband, my wife. I like my job. I'm just getting ready to retire. Remember Lot's wife? God rescued Lot and his family before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, but he had told him, don't look back. Sally, why did she look back? God was rescuing them. And when the Bible says that she looked back in the Hebrew, that look back had a longing. In the Hebrew, it's a picture of a longing gaze, the kind of give Trudy every day when I see her. A longing gaze. You know, just... And she turned into a pillar of salt. I, I submit there are people that profess Jesus who, if truth be known, they'd rather stay here than be with Jesus. Oh, 
ultimately, they eventually, but I'd rather be here. I'm with Paul. I'm hard pressed. I got my first retirement information. Man, you know, that's, you know what I mean? IRS said, if you wait to 65 and 10 months, dude, I'm thinking I, I could be with Jesus by then. They said, here's what you'll get. And I'm thinking, as long as Jesus gives me breath in my lungs and a sound mind, why would I retire? If y'all got to build a ramp and, and bring me up here in a wheelchair and you'll still have me. Retire, retire from what? Friend, let me tell you something. You can retire from your secular job, but you better not retire from the work of the kingdom. In fact, you ought to look at secular retirement as, an, as a time in which you can give 100% to the kingdom. Well, I don't know what to do. My spouse died. Yeah, I do. Get busy for the kingdom. 1 Peter 1.3 said this. One of my favorite verses, we've looked at it in the... Said, by the way, man, if you got teenage sons, you want them to come and just sort of soak in what's going on, man, bring them on, bring them on. We, man, the word of God, you know, that's how people come to faith for faith cometh by hearing, right? Uh, for believing in Christ, hearing about Christ through the word of God. It is the two edged sword. It is the sword of the spirit. It is what God has given us to lead each other to Christ. Listen to what Peter wrote. Now, the reason Peter wrote this letter, man, you know what this is, but the reason Peter wrote this letter was because the people that this letter was given to, they were starting to come into some great suffering and persecution, okay? And, and because of that, Peter wanted to pen them a letter, or actually it was the Holy Spirit through Peter. And what Peter did, if you read this whole letter through, the first chapter and a half is Peter reminding them that they're saved, what their inheritance is, it's eternal, God's keeping it, and, 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 and then he gets into, now I've got some things that are going to be difficult to hear, to walk through in the midst of all the trials, tribulations that you're about to encounter. But he starts out with this launching to that first chapter and a half, reminding these Christians in the midst of the suffering exactly what they have, which is what I'm doing today. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, remember Ephesians 2, 4, but God, amen, but God, we looked at that, but God, here we see it again, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, to what? To a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have been birthed into a living hope through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We of all people should wake up with a smile, with a song in our heart. We ought to walk this planet in the midst of the darkness, letting the light of Christ shine forth, smiling, happy, singing joyously. Why? Because we have been birthed into a living hope. We know how it ends. Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. I got the rest of the story. Jesus wins. Read Psalm 2. So guys, I'm, si I'm about to be 62. I, I tell Trudy all the time, her genetics, she'll probably live to be about 105 I said, I'm going to be long gone before you, girl. And listen, there are times when I start to think, and you say, man, that's sick. Don't think about death. Oh, yeah, well, Ecclesiastes 7 says, better to go in a house of mourning than a house of pleasure, for this is the end of every man, and the wise take it to heart. We better be thinking about our own demise and make sure we got what we say we got. Okay? I have to come back to 1 Peter 1, 3. Matthew 28, 6. Do not be afraid. 
Do not be afraid. Afraid of what? Of death, the hell on us. Don't be afraid. Man, we got to quit being afraid. Right? We got to stand up tall. Even in the midst of suffering. Man, listen, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm a fellow sufferer. Now, last four, th four years, I don't know, baby, how long it's been. I, I'm in pain every day. I take a pain pill every morning when I get out of bed. Because if I don't, my attitude can go down pretty quick. Because what happens is I withdraw into myself. And, and, and I just, I, it takes all my might to try to keep my mind over my pain. Then I go out, I put on some praise and worship music. I open my Bible and I'm reminded of all the great truths that God has embedded in my heart. In 1 Peter 1, 3, that line, we have been birthed because of God's great mercy. We have been birthed into living hope. Walk every day in that living hope. God's got you. Remember when the beggar and the rich man died? You know, Jesus in that, I mean, I got to hurry. Jesus in that story peeled back the curtain of eternity. You know that? You, you know that, right? In Luke, he, he, he literally, to, to, to those people that they pat, he peeled back the mystery of what was up at day. He, he peeled it back in the story of, 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 of the beggar and the rich man. And, and, and when they both died, because by the way, it, uh, Hebrews 9 tells us it's appointed on a man was, hey, rich or poor, you're dying. Bill Gates, you ain't got enough money. Okay, uh, Jeff, Jeff. Amazon, dude, you ain't got enough money. It's appointed un, unto men once to die. So we're all headed that way. But we have been birthed into a living hope. And Sally, as that day comes, may we hear the words of the angel to those ladies at the tomb, do not be afraid. For he has risen just as he said. May we walk in that today. And I want to end today with a fourth one. The resurrection assures us of a reunion day with our loved ones. I want to put that in right perspective because, you know, we all think that the best part of that day is going to be grandma and grandpa, mom and dad. The best part of that day is going to be seeing Jesus face to face. Amen. And if that's not what you think, that means it, 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 how carnal your mind is operating that you still care more about what you can see than the Lord you can't see. First Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18, Paul writes, but we do not, they had written him and they had asked him what happens to the, our loved ones who die. Who, and Paul says, but we do not want you to be uninformed or in some translations, ignorant brethren about those who are asleep. And that word asleep there means death. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, I want to make it clear. He never said, don't grieve the loss of a loved one. In fact, my son told me, he said, no, dad, I'm going to preach your funeral. I'm like, how cold is that? I want him blowing snot bubbles on the front row, man. You know what I mean? I want him to grieve some. I got a buddy that can preach my funeral. I'm just kidding. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall always we be with the Lord. And then verse 18, therefore, bridge, connector, therefore, because of what I just told you, comfort one another with these words. So when you're at the funeral of a Christian and his family who are also Christians are grieving, you know what Paul said? This is what we want to comfort them with. I mean, beyond, I'm sorry for your loss. Here, right here, Paul said, hey, comfort one another. Hey, it's all right, Sally, you're going to see TR again. Amen? How do I know? 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. TR's coming out. Earl's coming out. My mama's coming out. And we who are alive are going to meet them in the air. To spend all of eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ and his father. Mm -mm -mm. How can we leave here with anything but a skip in our step? A song in our heart? And joy overflowing. Just because of these four truths of the resurrection. It validates, you know, it, it, if the first one's not right, none of the other three will be right. It validates Jesus. When he got up out of the grave, he was the son of God with power. How, Paul? How, how was he the son of God with power? Through the resurrection. Man, it completes the gospel. It takes both the death and resurrection of Jesus for the gospel, the whole message. Sally, you got to tell them both. It conquers the grave. I mean, we're living in dark times, man. 14-year-old girl, do you read that? A, a, a car, I guess, ran through a stop sign and hit a truck, pickup truck. It rolled over like four times. If, you're, if your family, that person, because I read it in our local, if your family, that person, listen, I love you. That 14-year-old girl had no idea when she got up that morning it was going to be her last day on this earth. God knew it. She didn't. And wherever she's at, she's at. You see, what I'm trying to tell you, young people, is you think you've got 30, 40, 50 years to do this Jesus thing. Maybe. Or maybe you won't see sunrise. Amen. Only God knows. Only God knows. But let me tell you something. God does know the number of your days. And some, it's 14, 8, 20, 60, 40, 90. Trudy's case, 105. And I'm telling you, quit chasing after that which is going to perish. Oh, man, if I surrender to Jesus, man, I'm not going to be able to do this and that and this and that. And my friends won't like me. Yeah, maybe all that's true. But see, you're only thinking of the negative. You're not thinking of all the benefits of being a child of God. And man, God is going to give you a whole new family. Amen. It's called the church. And we'll love you. If all your friends disown you, you got all these people that'll become your friends. Yeah, but you're old. Just means I'm wise. Listen to me, child. Let me end with a song. I'm not singing. Um. And you know what, Jeff, you had to sing that song because sometimes I'll quote this at the end because he lives because that's my favorite song. But I put in and Google this week. Oh, what a happy day, because that's what I was thinking of resurrection morning. Oh, what a happy day. Here it is. Maybe you know it. Maybe you don't. Let me read it to you. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. On that happy golden shore. What a day. Glorious day that it will be. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face. The one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand. And leads me through the promised land. What a day. Glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear. No more sickness. No pain. No more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. 
What a day, a glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when on my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. And that song is only true and can only be sung because the angel of the Lord declared on that third day, he is not here for he has risen just as he said. Leave with joy. Leave with a, skip, a spiritual skip in your step. Ignore that pain for a bit. Amen. It's nah. No, you ain't winning right now. Man, go eat a bite to eat. I don't care if it's peanut butter and jelly, bologna, or a steak. Eat it with joy. Thank God for his provision of his son and what you're about to eat, the roof over your head, the car you drive, the clothes you wear. God, all of that is your provision for me, your child. And ultimately, the greatest provision you ever gave me is your son and his resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Father, I love you so much. I love resurrection morning. Yes, Father, as Peter said, we have been birthed into a living hope uh, through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, God, I, I, I clearly understand that each morning we ought to wake with that hope, with that living hope. Each day, if we'll start it with you, some praise and worship, a, 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 just a, a, a little morsel of your word committing our day to you, dying to self, picking up our cross, and following Jesus, not surrendering to the desires and lust of this world. I'm going to represent the Lord Jesus Christ as his ambassador. He died for me so that I would no longer live for myself but live for the one who died and rose again. Oh, Paul, I agree so much. May the love of Christ control me. I pray this in the name of the only begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.